Hi, welcome to class number two of our English uh, production that we're doing for the NIOS English number 302. Thank you for coming. I'm very happy to be here. You're very smart students because as you learn English, your whole life becomes more successful. What I'd like to do is to review class number one. And um, when we review a class, uh, we go over the high points. And one of the high points is the um, material itself. As you remember, we're doing an autobiography of Sunil Gaskovar. He uh, was a famous cricketer, and he wrote his own autobiography. So listen closely to the words as I pronounce them. I may never have become a cricketer, and this book, which is his autobiography, would certainly not have been written if an eagle-eyed relation, Mr. Narayana Masarkar, had not come into my life on the day I was born. Very important, the day he was born, July 10th, 1949. It seems that Nanakaka, which is what I call my uncle, came to see me in the hospital on my first day in this world. He noticed on my left earlobe a small hole at the top of that earlobe. The next day he came again and he picked up the baby lying in the crib next to my mother. To his utter horror, he discovered that the baby did not have the hole on his left earlobe. So he knew something was wrong. He frantically searched all the cribs in the hospital. And eventually, I was found sleeping peacefully next to a fisherwoman. And I was totally oblivious of the commotion that I had caused. The mix-up, it appears, followed after the babies had been given their daily bath. Providence had helped me to retain my true identity and in the process, charted the course of my whole life. I have often wondered what would have happened if nature had not marked my ear, marked me out, and given me my guard by giving me the small hole in my left earlobe, and if Nanakaka had not noticed this abnormality. Perhaps I would have been grown up to be an obscure fisherman, toiling somewhere on the West Coast. And what about the baby, who for a spell took my place? I do not know if he is interested in cricket or whether he will ever read this book. But I can only hope that if he does, he will start taking a little more interest in Suno Gaskovar. Gavaskar. The most vivid recollection of my childhood cricket playing days is the time I almost broke my mother's nose. She used to bowl in the small gallery of our house where we played our daily cricket match with a tennis ball. Since the area was small, she would kneel to bowl or ra rather than lob the ball to me. I hit one straight back and caught her bang on the nose, which started bleeding. Although it was a tennis ball, the distance between the two of us was very short, which accounts for the force that had hit her, the ball hit her. I was frightened, but she, but she just shrugged it off, washed her face, and the bleeding stopped. We continued the game. But for the rest of the day, I was only forward defense, only forward defense. I wouldn't take any attacking shot. I didn't want to hurt my mother. Cricket, to use the cliche, is in my blood. My father was a good club cricketer in his days and a keen student of the game. Even now we have interesting discussions on various aspects of the game and I have found his advice invaluable in the development of my career. As I have said already, I had the privilege of having a cricketing mother who helped me take the first steps in the game I have come to love. My uncle, Mahadev Mantri, 
who played for India in the first four official tests, though not very successfully, and he was a force to reckon with in the first class games. Whenever I went to my uncle's house, my favorite pastime used to be to take out his pullovers and caress them with a sense of longing. I was so attracted by the Indian test pullovers that I even once dared to ask him if I could take one. Since he had so many, my uncle told me that one had to sweat and to earn the Indian colors and that I too should work hard to earn that distinction. This is a lesson I have never forgotten. Looking back, I am glad that my uncle did not succumb to my childish fancy and instead taught me there was no shortcut to the top. I was also fascinated by the many souvenirs he had and the large number of trophies he had won. What I liked most was the stump bearing the autographs of the 1952 India and English teams. I used to love to linger over the, photogra or the autographs of every player. Right from the beginning, I wanted to become a batsman. He wanted to be the hero. And I hated losing my wicked. This became such an obsession with me that if the rest of the boys ever got me out, I would fight and eventually walk home with the ball and bat. This would bring the game to an abrupt end since nobody else had a ball and bat. The boys cursed me and called me names, but the tension did not last long, and generally we got along very well. Among these early comrades with whom I played were the Ambaya brothers and the Mandraka brothers and several others who made up our team. Whenever I batted, they would decide beforehand that they would appeal a particular ball and whether I was out or not. I had to go by the majority. They made Sunil agree that he would go with the majority verdict. We often played matches against teams of boys made up in neighboring buildings. And there was tremendous interest in the trophies, as we call them. These trophies were small white metal cups, which we contributed for and bought for as little as one rupee 50 paisa. So, as we finished the class last time, I gave you a homework assignment, and the homework assignment was the four questions on overall questions. The first question was how did Uncle's keen observation help Gavaskar to retain his identity as the proper baby to be with his mother? The answer, you've written your own answer, but your answer should go along these lines. Gavaskar's maternal uncle came to visit him in the hospital at the time of his birth. His keen observation helped him to spot a hole near the upper part of the left earlobe of the child. The child, in the meantime, got mixed up with another one, born to a fisherwoman in the same hospital. His uncle was quick to notice the missing hole in the child's ear. The search revealed him sleeping behind a fisherwoman. Thus, he was able to keep his identity due to his uncle's observation. Question number two, how did Gavaskar's family members help him to become a good cricketer? What did his mother, father, and uncle do? The answer written in these particular words should be like this. Gavaskar got his first cricketing lessons at home. His mother's nose was hurt by a shot from Gavaskar's bat. Still, she continued to play with him. His father, himself a good club-level cricketer, gave him useful tips. He discussed the finer points of the game with him. His uncle, Mahadev Mantri, had represented India in test matches. He inspired him to work hard. He told him there was no shortcut to success. The third question I ask you to do was how did Gavaskar behave during the matches played in his childhood days? How did his friends handle him on these occasions? The answer, 
Gavaskar hated losing the wicket. He would walk away with the bat and ball on getting out. The game would end thus, and his friends abused him. His friends handled this tactfully. They would decide to appeal in a chorus at some particular ball, and he had to go out of the gen with the general verdict against him. Thus they made a team, and they all played together. The fourth question was, in his childhood days, Gavaskar was not a sporting player. He would walk away with the bat and ball whenever he was declared out, which brought the game to an abrupt end. How would you, as a friend of yours, convince him to behave in a different manner? The answer, I would convince my friend to keep in mind that no player is bigger than the game itself. The sportsman's spirit is the supreme quality that should be observed in a game. He should learn to accept the decision, even if it is a harsh one. Cricket is a gentleman's game. There is no room for dissent here. Show respect to the rules of the game. Now that we've reviewed the first class, let's go into the second class in which we will learn about creating new words and to do simple past tense of verbs. So why do we create new words? English is a phenomenal language. I want you to know that 1,100 words are created every year. New words are created to go along with the ever-changing times that we're in. New words, you ask? I'll give you three examples. The word freegan, F-R-E-E-G-A-N. Do you know what that means? It means that you are free and that you eat vegan food, mostly vegetarian food without much dairy. That's freegan. How about fake news? Fake news is a new word that's become popular. And this is a word that means certain um, uh, people, especially news stations and uh, editorialists, will try to change your mind about a subject using material that is not exactly true. Fake news. And how about the new one? We've got this craze going on with cell phones. It's called nomophobia. And that's the word that means you go very anxious. You're so anxious you can't find your cell phone. Or somebody is taking your cell phone. You've got a case of nomophobia. So, vocabulary enrichment. Let's formulate new words. Compound words. New words are formed in many ways. Sometimes you make a new word by adding a prefix, that's a couple of letters before the word, or a suffix, a couple of letters after the word. For example, to say that someone sang very well, you can add L-Y to beautiful and form the new word beautifully. He sang beautifully. You were so touched by his words. Or to say that Sunil Gavaskar was not aware of what was happening, he was only a baby, he didn't know it one day old, around him, you would add UN to aware and form a new word, unaware. He was unaware of what was going on. In the above examples, LY is a suffix and UN is a prefix. Another way of forming a new word is by putting two words together. This is done because a single noun or a single adjective is often not enough to refer clearly to a person or a thing or a quality. You want to get a good communication across. So you want to use a compound word and show clearly what you're trying to convey. When this is the case, a compound word is used which consists of two words put together. Look at the following examples of compound words. There is a huge swimming pool in the club. You can see this swimming pool. It's huge. It covers the whole top of this club. So huge and swimming are put together. The bus stop is overcrowded at peak hours. Peak hours are the hours when everybody wants to get into town or get out of town. It's a compound Noun. Sunil Gavaskar 
mother was a good-tempered lady. She gets hit in the nose, breaks her nose, but she still wants to keep playing the game. She didn't yell at Sunil. She didn't cry. She was good-tempered. So that's a compound adjective. Good is an adjective. Tempered is an adjective. Four, I traveled to Bombay in a second-class apartment. Compound adjective. Uh, the adjective is second. Second is an adjective. And so you'll see that compound words are written in three ways. Sometimes, the first one, some compound words are written with a space between the two words. For example, car park. Car and then park. Next one is gas and stove. You can see they're put together. They mean something, but they're not connected together. They have a space between them. And that's usually the way these new words are formed. They're started off by talking about the words with a space between them. And then after they get popular, they sometimes they'll take the space out. Now, some compound words are formed by putting a hyphen between the two words. For example, eagle-eyed, 24. And so they have a hyphen between the two words. And some compound words are joined together, completely joined together. Uh, for example, fisherman, fisherwoman, and staircase. So, the note here is compound words are usually written as two separate words. Compound adjectives are usually joined together with a hyphen. So what's the best thing to do? It's to go to your good friend, your dictionary. The bottom line is we have to have a physical dictionary or use it on your cell phone. But look at this dictionary all the time. Check out every word. It's got new meanings and uh, it'll tell you correctly which way to put the uh, words together. So let's go through some questions. Uh, let's form some new words here. By choosing one word from group A and any word from group B. Let's make some compound words. Let's, sh let's show you how easy it is. You may write the new word formed in one of the ways discussed above. For example, you would write mother-in-law as mother-in-law, okay, with the hyphens, not as mother-in-law, because this is actually the correct way to spell it, like that. So let's go to some, uh, some uh, samples. First group, A, we have the word first. So let's go down our list here and we'll see what will, ha what will go with first. We have stove, maker, hand, first class. First class, don't we all like to go first class? We fly in a plane, we want to sit up in first class. Or we're in a bus or anything that has a first class compartment. So first goes with class. Four, let's go down our list. We have stove, maker, hand, class, footed, four-footed. What's four-footed? A cow, a dog, they're all four-footed. We're lucky, we're humans, we're two-footed, we can run fast. Let's go three. Three, da-da-da-da-da, class-footed, year old. Three-year-old, that makes sense. Three-year-old. Then let's go to before. Before. Go down our list, we have stove, maker, hand. Beforehand. Something, before it happens, we know beforehand that this class is going to be fun. We love learning English. We listen to an English teacher that can pronounce the words properly, and he gives us what we need to know so we can communicate in English with people all over the world. We know beforehand it's going to be a fun class. Gas. Let's go down our list here. Gas, right first one, stove. Gas stove. We have many kinds of stoves. There's wood stoves, okay, pellet stoves, but a gas stove. That, that's our answer right there. Trouble. That's a cute word. Trouble maker. Stove maker. What's a troublemaker? There's always one boy in the class who doesn't want to pay attention. Throwing spitballs, you know, doing all sorts of stuff. What does the teacher call him? He calls him a troublemaker. <laughs> okay. Inter. Let's go down the list. Inter, inter, inter class. We see class there. Inter class. There's an inter class um, confusion. If one boy is not paying attention and disrupting the class, it's an inner class confusion. 
Let's go to short. Short, bing, 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 class footed, three year old, colored, crumbs, sighted, short sighted. You see people with glasses, right? They're either far sighted or short sighted. They can't see things close or they can't see things far. So short sighted. Bread, let's go down our list footed, three year old, colored, crumbs. Bread crumbs. We all know we've all eaten a lot of bread and they crumble apart and we end up sucking up the crumbs or throwing them to the birds. White, white will go along down our list, footed, year old, colored. White colored. Some people have white colored hair, especially old grandmothers. They have white colored hair. We've got another page. Let's go through these words. Bald. What does that go with? Mother, sighted, friend, headed. Some people are bald headed. What can they do? That's the way God made them. Next word, brother. Brother, uh, mother, sighted, man, headed, in-law. If you get married, your wife has got a brother. Guess what? You've got a brother-in-law. Letter. Letter goes with moth, sighted, man, headed, in-law, box. Letter box. Of course, it's a mailbox. Some are big, some are smaller, but people like to have a box to get their mail. Night. Let's go down our list. Night, night sighted, night man, night mother, night headed, night box, night over, all the way then, nightfall. What happens at sunset? The night falls down. Especially in India, it falls down quickly. In America, when in Chicago where I'm at, the nightfall takes a while because it's a higher, it's a higher um, latitude. Bats. Let's go down our list. Bats mother sighted bats man. You're on the cricket team, you're a batsman. You get a chance to score some points. Pull. Pull mother sighted man headed in-law pull box. Pull over. Pull, pull over. Of course, in India we have these pullovers we, and we want to get them. Beautiful colors. Far, so now we have far, mother, sighted. We have short sighted on the other uh, list. Now we have far sighted. This person can see way into the distance. He's far sighted, like an eagle. Grand, we have grandmother, first one on the list, grandmother. So we put these things together and the two words mean something different than the two words separately. Grand is nice, big. Mother means your own mother. You put them together, it's the mother of your mother. In text questions, fill in the blanks with the words that we have just created. Okay, so now this is a, a, a little detective operation that we have to do. We've got to look at the whole thing and use the right word from those 18 words we've just created to fill in the spaces, okay? So every evening, somebody used to sit on the veranda of her sewing machine. We go through our 18 uh, uh, names and we only have one that will fit that bill. It's a lady. It's a grandmother. So we use the word grandmother. Every evening, grandmother used to sit on the veranda with her sewing machine. She stitched clothes for her grandson, Ollie. After finishing her work, she would feed the sparrows with. And we go down our list. And there's not much you can feed them with except for bread, breadcrumbs. Yeah, the breadcrumbs, the birds like that. It's nice and small. They go around, they pick it all up. Okay, so she feeds them with breadcrumbs. The sparrows would come and perch themselves on the, and we look at our list, and what do we have for a sparrow to perch itself on? We have two words there. We have uh, a letter box or a gas stove. On a veranda, sometimes you'll have a stove outside so you can cook something for a little barbecue or heat something up. Or you'll, and you'll have a letter box over in the corner. So these sparrows would land on these two and look for the crumbs. They like to be up high. They don't like to be on the ground unless there's food there. So you can put either one there. They would perch themselves on the gas stove or on the letter box. Soon, all the crumbs were eaten up. They don't, wait to, they don't wait around. They gobble them up. Grandmother, who was, 
Now, she could be farsighted or short-sighted. We have both words here. But the fact is, when you get older, usually you're short-sighted. You have to have glasses so you can see what's right in front of you and do your reading. So let's put in, she was short-sighted. Could not see the sparrows clearly, but she knew each sparrow who came and sat in her veranda every day. The sparrows all have different qualities. Some have a big head, some are big, some are small, some are bold. Anyway, she knew each one of them. She had a personal uh, relationship with them. She was a happy grandmother. Now, let's go ahead to the second part of our second lesson, which is simple one-word questions or statements, okay? And it's in the past. Grammar, the simple past. What does simple mean? Simple means it's only one word, all right? Not a whole bunch of words, not a phrase. Simple. Read the following sentences. Sunil Gavaskar wanted to become a great batsman. All right? When he was young, he had a desire. I want to be a, I want to be a great batsman, okay? So when he, when he finished being a great batsman, and you know he was born in 1949, now he's retired, helping the whole world out. He wanted ED to become a great batsman. Two, he hated losing his wicket. He, was, he didn't want to be out. He wanted to be on all the time. Three, playing cricket was an obsession with him. He wanted to play cricket, and so going back from today, back to his past, he wa it was an obsession with him. I've got to be a good cricketer. Four, the doctor examined my teeth. He went to a doctor, a dentist, or a doctor, a doctor of dentistry, and he exa they examine his teeth. They look at him to examine the teeth. Once they're done, they have examined the teeth. Now you notice uh, uh, some differences here. Notice that all the events took in the place in the past. Everything is past tense. That is, all the above actions were completed in the past or happened in the past. Also note that no helping verb, helping verbs are like was, were, had, etc., are used in the above sentences. It's simple. It's only one word. Such use of verbs is called the simple past. The simple past tense is formed by adding the letters ed or d to the verb in its bare form, its base form, bare form, base form. For example, work. I'm going to work, okay? I'm going to work today. So you go to work, you come back, you're tired because you have worked hard all day. The work is uh, in the past, okay? You've already done your work. So you put ED on the end of work because you've worked. It's past. Create, okay? I want to create a beautiful work of art. I want to design the best picture I've ever seen. So you work all day and work for a couple of days and you create this beautiful picture. Then you've created the picture. The picture is done. But you'll see create ends with an E. C-R-E-A-T-E. -E. You don't need to put another ED on the end. You just put one D and create becomes created. I created a beautiful work of art. So that's the difference. When the uh, word ends in an E, all right, you don't have to add ED. Most of the time you just add D. But to make sure, you go to your friend the dictionary and make sure that's the right spelling. And want, I want to play cricket, becomes wanted. I wanted to play cricket when I was young. Now, note, Irregular verbs like go, come, see, find, etc., and be and have form their past tense in other ways. We have the base form here, go, come, see, find, be, have, give, and am and is. I've added a couple more. Okay, and over here, we show the past form. So I'll, I will give you the correct words to put in here. Because these are irregular verbs, go, the past form, is I want to go to the store. 
You go to the store. When you come back, you say, I went to the store. Go to the store. You finished going. You've went to the store. Come. Okay. I want to come to your house. You go to the person's house. You come back. I came to that house. The past form, past simple form, is came for come. See, I want to see the game. I went to the game, and I, I saw the game. The game was over. My team lost. Not a good game. Find, what's the past simple tense? I want to find, I want to find my cell phone. And you look all over. You finally get it. What happened? You found your cell phone. B, I want to be over somewhere else. I want to be at my grandmother's house. You go to your grandmother's house, you come back, and you have been at your grandmother's house. Past tense, simple, is been. Have, okay, I have three, uh, I have three rupees with me. And uh, I'm going to the store. I spend the three rupees on a couple of small candies, all right? So now I don't have those rupees anymore. I had three rupees. I don't have them anymore, past tense. Give, I put this one on here because you students and you people that are watching this English are generous people. You give of your time, you give of your money, you give of your attention, you want to help people. So when you give it out and you're done giving it, you say that you have gave. I gave this nice family some food. They were afflicted, afflicted by this COVID-19. I went and I gave them a bag of groceries. So that's the past tense. And now there is two words that are used very often. I am, I am happy, I am uh, joyful. Or that he, another person, you could say he is or she is, okay? So when you say I am, the past tense of am is was. I was happy. I was happy doing the seva, all right? Now, he is is also the same past tense. He is going to do some work and then he was going to do some work. The past tense is the same for both. So we have eight base forms here, and we have, uh, we have eight, uh, eight um, I'm sorry, we have nine base forms here, and we have eight past forms. So these words are used all the time in English. You have to know these words. You've got to put them in memory. So I'm going to give you a homework assignment, a nice easy assignment. And the assignment is the assignment is to memorize these 16 uh, I'm sorry, these uh, 17 words, eight and nine. Memorize these and know which one is the past of that. And then uh, the second part of your homework, okay, is to review the words that we've created. We've created 18 words. Look over them. See how they feel, uh, know, the, know the definition of them, and we will use those words and the uh, grammar that we've learned today in our next lesson. So please, look over the words and re uh, review these uh, 17 words, commit them to memory so we can be good English students and communicate with the whole world. Thank you very much.